Okay, we're in Jeremiah chapter 32. We're going to do verses uh, 1 through 25 today. Uh, Before we get started, Jeremiah was told about an amazing future last time. Uh, Don taught about the new covenant. So when we say new covenant, what does that mean to you? What is the new covenant? Okay, so Jesus institutes the new covenant. What is it? What's going to happen? What's the... What's the, who's the primary focus of the new covenant? It's not the church. The primary focus, the first focus was Israel. Israel, the Jews, the Jews. Remember, Jer- it's in Jeremiah 31. <laughs> yeah, we just went through that. And then we benefit because we're grafted into Israel. Now, when did the new covenant come into effect? Was it when Jesus was born? Was it when Jesus, ah, good job, Leslie, yes. When Jesus died, that instituted the new covenant. Now, how do we celebrate the new covenant today? We have a very special service that we, communion, yes, yes. It's a new covenant in his blood. This is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, what do many people think about the new covenant? Many Christians today deny the new covenant was for Israel, and they believe something that we do not believe here. They believe that the church has replaced Israel. We call that supersessionism, superseded. The church has superseded Israel. Now, why do we not believe that? Ah, the promise for Israel. In what in what form? What they come in? Ah, okay, so they're covenants. Covenants and the Abrahamic covenant in particular, which promised three things, three things. <laughs> Those three things were what a land seed and a blessing and a blessing. So that's what we went Don went through a whole bunch of that last week. Uh, Jeremiah's dungeon experience is going to be chapters, uh, verses one through five and 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, in 597, he was, came into, a, into power. This is probably 587. This is the 10th year. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. That's right. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. The siege is started. And, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. Now, what kind of dungeon experience is he having in the court of the prison? Okay, so it's it's not good, but it's not... uh, Who said that? Way back there was an echo. Say it again. House arrest, that's right, kind of like Paul in his first imprisonment. People could come and go. People could come and go. And uh, you were going to see that. And just He's not in the pit. He's not in the slimy pit that you see him in like chapter 38 or something. He's actually thrown in an awful, nasty, dark, wet dungeon. But here he's kind of like in house arrest, in, in, the house, in Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up saying, Why do you prophesy? And say, thus says the Lord. Now, this is Zedekiah speaking, repeating what Jeremiah has said to him. Behold, I will give this this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Now, if God says that, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to fall. It's going to fall. I mean, I don't know what Zedekiah is thinking. I mean, it's going to fall. It's something that's going to happen. So we call that a fate day complete. This thing is going to happen. No way out. So, uh, I give the city in the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall take it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape. Must have took a big gulp at that time. From the hand of the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him face to face. Now, again, Zedekiah is repeating what Jeremiah has told him. That you're telling me I'm going to be before Nebuchadnezzar face to face and I'm going to be taken prisoner. Eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon. There he he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. 
Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. So there's a bunch of things going under here. Jerusalem is under siege. God has had enough with Judah. No more. No more is he going to put up with them, their rebellion, their idolatry. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to be used as something. He's an extension of God's, who said that? Oh, that was good. Wrath, wrath, echo. Wrath, it's an extension of God's wrath. Now, this is important because I believe that in the tribulation period, the Antichrist is used as an extension of God's wrath when he starts the seals, trumpets, and bowl judgments. Some of those are going to be God's wrath, but when you start out with the seal judgments, it sounds like Antichrist is going to be involved in those things. So that's an extension of his wrath. Now, we've been to this scripture before. Turn with me. To Second Chronicles thirty six fifteen. And this should be familiar to you because we've been to this before. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by messengers. Now, if you're sending a warning, a messenger, that person would pr- probably be a what? What would his position be? A, a who? Prophet. Good job. Yes, yes, Ryan. A prophet rising up early, sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They mocked the prophets, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no enemy. Now, make no mistake, this word wrath is really wrath. It is keha. It means wrath anger, rage, indignation. He's pouring out his wrath using Nebuchadnezzar, the next verse. Therefore, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no compassion on the young man or virgin or on the aged or on the weak. He gave them all into his hand. So God is using Nebuchadnezzar as an extension of his wrath. Does anybody have any questions about this? Or any thoughts? Is there anything firing? Okay. Zedekiah is the last king to reign in Judah prior to captivity. Now, this is going to be a hard question for some of you, but some of you are going to have it on the tip of your tongue. Who was Zedekiah's dad? Oh, 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 I heard it. I heard a whisper. Josiah, yes, king. And he was the last good king in Israel. And you know what scripture says about Josiah? There was no king like Josiah. No king who did what he did with such fervency and tearing down the bales and the ashtras and all the idol worship. There was no king like Josiah. Zedekiah thought he was safe. And he made an allegiance with someone. Do you remember who that allegiance was? Who was the other power at the time? Egypt, that's right, Egypt. So Necro, I think the guy's name was, I didn't write it down here, of Egypt. Just pretend it's that guy, okay? Anyway, it's whoever, whoever that pharaoh is. He thought his protection was going to be there. God says, no, no, no. No, no, no. You're going to fall, Zedekiah. But he put his trust in Egypt. Now, Egypt is what? A picture of the, the world. The world. Pharaoh's a picture of the Satan. Of of Satan. Not of the, of Satan. So, uh, can you recall another great Bible figure who went down to Egypt without consulting God? Ah, good. Yes, this is a good family right here. Good, Good job. Yes. Abraham. Abraham went down. That's where he picked up Hagar. And then we have all this trouble in our world today with the Jews and the Arabs and that sort of thing. So uh, so he went down. Abraham, there was a famine in the land and Abraham made a flesh decision. He did not consult God. And he just went on his own. This looked like the place to go. That's where the food is. Did not consult God. Zedekiah did not like what the man of God said when he he was put into a dungeon. Now, again, when you think of dungeon, you're thinking of cisterns and cold and chains and that sort of thing. That wasn't the case here. This is house arrest at this time. House arrest. 
Uh, who put Jeremiah in the prison? Not a difficult question. Zedekiah put him in the prison. And, and again, why did he do that? Because he said what? Oh, he, he told the truth. He told them that these bad things are going to happen to him. What did Zedekiah do? He did not want to hear the truth. So what did he gather around him? A great number of false prophets to say, as it says in Timothy, what their itching ears, what his itching ears wanted to hear. That happens today. People gather around them, people to, to say what they want to hear. That's what happened with Zedekiah. So Zedekiah says this, you will fight, but you will not succeed. Now, again, what did Zedekiah want to hear? What do many people want to hear today? Particularly when you're teaching Bible prophecy. If you're in a church that actually teaches Bible prophecy, which is just kind of an anecdotal note, how much of Scripture is prophecy? Good. It's, it's about 25, 27% in, in that area. So it's a big, good chunk of Scripture. That's prophecy. But many people don't want to engage in prophecy. Why? It's scary. It's too hard to interpret. And we have to dig too much to try to get to the truth. There's too many opinions. And big thing is, it's too scary. It's too scary. Don't tell me about this bad stuff that's coming. Don't tell me about the bad stuff that's coming. So, uh, what, would Zedek, what, what should Zedekiah have done? Now, he was told by Jeremiah what was going to happen. As you're thinking about that, turn to Jeremiah 27, 11. What should he have done? He should have listened to the prophet because what did God say would happen if he had listened to, to Jeremiah? Say what? They would be saved. Good job, Maritza. Yes. So 2711, I think it's there. Uh, it, it's in 27, the, the bonds and the yokes things. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they, and they shall till it and dwell it, dwell in it. I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all the words saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation? Zedekiah had a chance. Had he listened to the true prophet, he had a chance. And he did not heed the prophet. Now, it's one thing to hear. It's another thing to heed, to do what God is telling you to do. So what do we learn from this with the, as far as the false prophets? Don't listen to the false prophets. <laughs> Even though they're telling you that the stock market's going to go up and there's not going to be a crash. Even though they're telling you that these trillions of dollars of debt don't mean anything. Don't listen to the false prophets. Yes, that's what we do. Today, many do not want to hear about Bible prophecy. God wants people to know what is coming. Now, it may be scary, but God wants people to know. Now, he wants them to know for what reason? Ah, good job, Scott. Yes, to be prepared for what is coming. Good, good. Absolutely. To prepare you. To not be in shock when these things start to happen. To not be in shock if someone becomes president whom we don't think should be president. I believe that's accelerating our globalistic push. Now, we don't know if God's going to raise up somebody that will stop that. Now, I'm not saying Donald Trump is Josiah. Because King Josiah was a righteous man. But remember, God stayed his hand for Israel when he promised to destroy Israel for 33 years. Could have been 31. Could have been some 30-something years. I can't remember. But anyway, he stayed his hand. And he did not destroy until Josiah had passed. So if you get, you can, God can slow his, his move uh, if, if people turn and he, you get the right leader. So, so what does God tell us to do in preparation for what is coming to two, two words? Watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. Watch and be ready, church. Watch and be ready, church. Now, I want to share with you something. I have a friend that I worked with. And he goes to a church in Marshall, and they teach 
scripture and that sort of thing. But he knows they know nothing about prophecy. They know nothing about what's going on in the world. And he asked me, he says, are things happening today that, that could look like it's the end time? And I went, oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. See, people aren't being prepared for what is coming. People are not being prepared. It is important that you have some clue as to what's happening. So, it is scary. Because that's the majority of the church. See, the majority of the church are, are preterists that, that believe Revelation had, had as all, that Revelation 6 through 19, the tribulation period, happening during Nero's time and uh, in Rome and that sort of thing. And so it doesn't apply to today. They're, they're, they're sleeping. They've been lulled into, into complacency. So uh, remember this. He does it so that we're not fearful and, and overwhelmed with it. Remember, whenever you see something happening, God is working all things out according to the counsel of his will. He is. He's in charge. And he raises up kings and he takes down kings. And he gives the people the king that they desire, particularly in a republic. That's the tragic thing. So if we get a bad king, it's on us as the people. So verses uh, 6 through 8, God's strange command to Jeremiah. Verse 6 through 8, and Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, so this has to be his cousin, will come to you saying, buy my field, which is an anoth. Difficulty with Anoth, it has already been taken over. It's the, the property is, has no value at this time. For the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Ano Ana, Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours. And the redemption yours, buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. He's told the guy's coming. The guy comes. He knows it's the word of the Lord. So he's in prison. He's in prison. The nation's under siege. It looks hopeless. And then God puts something else on Jeremiah. Buy this worthless piece of land. It's a command to buy the land. And I can imagine Jeremiah is doing what you would do. You know, what? <laughs> Exactly. What are you? What are you talking about, God? What are you talking about? And the relative will come and offer what appears to be worthless lands. What do you think Jeremiah was thinking? The same thing we think oftentimes. If something was to happen to you, and it seems like it's the most inconvenient time, what do you, what do we what do we say? Really, Lord? Now? I mean, we got to do this now. I mean, I'm on the road. Uh, it, it the blizzard is coming. And the flat tire comes. Couldn't have happened in the nice weather. Couldn't have happened in the daytime. You know, those types of things happen. That's life. That's life. And we go, what is going on, Lord? I mean, remember, God is in this stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, so Jeremiah is thinking, really, the useless land. Uh, and remember, how silly we are to question God. How silly we are to question God. Why would the relative want to make the deal? I got this land for you, Jeremiah. It's not worth a nickel, but please pay for it. He wants to get rid of it. He wants to pass this thing off. He, wants to try, he must need money. He might be in a desperate state because of the situation of the nation. So the short-term prophecy came to fruition just like God said. Then I knew this was the word of the Lord. Verse 8. Now, let me ask you a question. It's on your notes. How do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? <laughs> the true prophet is always going to be right. He will give you the word. He will give you the word of God, not his word. The word of God. Uh, no matter how awful the situation is, the false prophet always tells the people what they want to hear. And it's the same thing with false teachers today. They tell the people what they want to hear. Now, what are some things that people want to hear in congregations? It's going to get better. Oh, 
universalism. <laughs> Everybody's saved. There is no hell. Uh, I mean, uh, that's goody. That's, yeah, that's great. We're all going to make it so I can live any way I want. Go ahead. No suffering. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, just get on your road. Find your own road because because you're so important. See, the main thing that, that, that people try to tell people is how great and wonderful they are. You're terrific. And God does look at you as his children, as valuable. He loves you implicitly. There's, there's nothing you can do to change his love for you, okay? But it's not all about you here. It's all about him here, not you, not you. So that's the important difference. Remember, what's the, what's, what's the three purposes of the church? Number one, glorify God, edify the saints. Oh, man, <laughs> Mike, yes. I'll give you a little high five there, buddy. Boom, right there. Good job. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Evangelize the world. Go in the world and preach the gospel, you know, Jesus' command. So, now, we have false prophets, and again, how does it relate to pastors today? They sugarcoat the word. And oftentimes, you're given a pep talk, and you are so wonderful. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says this. This is what the pastor is to do. This is what the Sunday school teacher is to do. This is what the home group leader is to do. This is what you are to do as the man of God if you're leading devotions within your home. Okay? Anybody that's leading this as we have been approved by God, entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. Now listen to this. Not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts, who documents our hearts. Is our heart approved or not approved? Many prosperity, progressive, seeker-friendly pastors promote everything is great and wonderful and terrific, and it's not. Now, if you are someone that is giving the truth of the word, there is a word that they call you. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 33, I think. That is Ezekiel 33. I'm going to stand on that one. It is, he calls you a watchman, a watchman on the wall. A watchman warns of the impending danger that is coming. Now, again, we don't want to be the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling all the time because we know that there's victory in Jesus. We know that we have strength and power to make it through this. We know that we have the Holy Spirit with us that allows us to endure all this stuff that's coming at us. But we want to warn people, this is what is coming. We're living in a world today that is spiraling out of control. So we have a job to, to be watchmen. Now, if you're a watchman, what is... What is, what is your main job? This isn't difficult. So what, what, I, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to warn people. What if the person doesn't hear? Do I keep bugging them? Well, Dave, you need to, you need to, get, you need to get right or get left, Dave. You need to go, oh, come on, Dave. You know, you know, no, we're not, the, we're not the, we, we are to warn, allow God to do his work, and then we back off. Then we back off. You will never pester someone into the kingdom of God. You will never convince someone. He, God will use you in the process. But as it was said earlier, God is the one that changes the heart. God is the one that softens the person. God is the one that allows the person to receive the message. It's between them. He uses you again. We, we can't abdicate our responsibility, but he will use us in that process. So uh, we constantly, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, some, some plant, some water, but who gets the harvest? God, God gets the harvest. Good job. Good students. Yes. Yes. Uh, when, let me ask you this question. When will America be great again? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. When it bows the knee to God, it is not going to be great if Donald Trump gets to be president. There's still going to be mess here. Mess here, big time. Just in my mind, less mess than the other one. But that's just me. So, so America will not be great again until America repents and turns to God. It will not be great. I don't care what party is in office. 
If America has to repent. Now I ask you a question. In the past, in the days of Washington, in the days of Lincoln, they had governmental leaders encouraging the people to pray. To be on their face before God and praying. Have you heard anything like that? With the tumult that is in Israel? With the hurricanes that are coming? All there is is finger pointing. You did this, you did this, you didn't do this. This party's blaming this party. Yeah, that's all we see. But you don't see people praying and seeking God. 9 through 15 is going to be the purchase. The purchase of the property. So I bought the field from Hamanel. Yeah, you bet he did. The son of my uncle, who was an Anathoth, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. Now, depending upon who you read, this is a great amount of money, or it's a little amount of money. And the most of the ones kind of come around that it's a little amount of money, but I, I don't know what it is. And I signed the deed and sealed it. And when you seal it, that makes it a complete, okay? It took witnesses, so it's legal, weighed the money on the scales. Why would he do that? Making sure it's an honest, he's being honest with it. Remember, it's a weight. So I took the purchase deed both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. And I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the, the son of Mahesia, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Now, that is a very public event. This land belongs to Jeremiah and by extension belongs to who? It belongs to God for sure. But there's going to be something. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me just wait for that question. You may never hear that question again, but at least for right now, wait for that question. Then I charge Baruch before them saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, we said this last week. We've said it like every single week in the past 17 years. So when I say Lord of hosts, it is God of armies. That's right. God all powerful. The God of armies says this. The God of Israel. Take these deeds, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. I'll take a stop. That's a promise. A promise of what? A promise of coming back to the land. A promise of return. They're going to return to the land. And they did return 70 years later. But there was also a promise given in, by many of the prophets that the Jews would return to their land. And we saw that miracle of the returning of the Jews and the Jews become a nation on May 14th, 19. Oh, good job, you guys. That's so good. Yes, yes. That, they returned in unbelief. But there will be a time when the Jews return in belief, when will that be? End of the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ. All Jews will dwell in the land. They're not going to be the majority in New York City or in Miami. They're going to be the, all of them will be dwelling in Israel, in that expanded land. True. Does the Bible, since nobody can hear it on the tape, uh, talk about Two returns, and yes, it does. A return in unbelief, and then a return in belief in the millennial reign. Good question. Good question. And actually, I have those verses in the back of my Bible here, but I would fumble around and dig around and try to make a cogent answer to that. But anyway, it's, that's the answer. So. so what did Jeremiah do? He bought, he obeyed, he bought the field. Now, how would he buy the field if he's in prison? He's in house arrest, but how does he get access to the 17 shekels? Ah, okay. Oh, good job. Yes, Sean. Yes. Baruch. Who is he? He's the, he, he's the scribe. 
You know, you know what Baruch is? You know what it means? Like, like Baruch, Barack Obama, Baruch Obama. It means blessing. Baruch Obama, Hashem Adonai. It's the only Hebrew I know. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed. 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 17 shekels. Not pricey, but the land was in captivity. And uh, he would... How would Jeremiah get this back? Investment? Stay tuned. Sign, he signed the deed. Jeremiah now owns what appears to be worthless property. Baruch gets the deed. And again, he's the scribe. He's the writer for Jeremiah. And Jeremiah tells Baruch to place it in an earthen vessel, a jar. What for? Preservation. Now, do you remember the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, at Qumran. In 1946, 47, in that area, these earthen vessels were discovered with, with parchment paper still intact. And, parts, and, and actually, Isaiah was almost fully intact, and parts of many other Old Testament scriptures were intact. And that was from 1,500 years prior, 500 you know, from Isaiah's time forward. So 2,500. What, what is that? 2,500, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a long time. A long time forward. And actually, I think I wrote that down someplace here, but I didn't. I don't see it. Uh, when will the deed become important? Ah, when they come back. Now, is Jeremiah going to experience this, de this deed? It's for Jeremiah. No. What happens to Jeremiah? You know, there, there's a, you know, we don't really know. Scripture doesn't tell us, but there's a postulate a theory that he dies in Egypt. That he dies in Egypt. And there's many other things, but nobody, nobody really knows. Uh, so 70 years will pass uh, before the land is purchased, is reclaimed. Israel will have a legal claim to the land when they return. Now, who gave Israel the title deed to the land? God. And in what covenant was that land given Abrahamic covenant if you ever have any mistake about anything just say Abraham Jesus Abraham Jesus you get most questions right Abraham or Jesus God's promise in verse 15 for thus says the Lord of hosts the God the Elohim of Israel there are many Elohims okay that have titles could be angels could be rulers but there is one supreme Elohim, and he is the Lord God Almighty who created all the other subordinate rulers. He is the God of Israel. He is our God. Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Now, this again is God's promise of return. You can count on his promises. Count on his promises. How does how does God's promise concerning Israel encourage you today? So we, we can count that God is a promise keeper. So what promises has God given us in his word? Anything that you might think is, is something valuable to you. Okay, he, he promises to go hold us close. And you said, oh, eternal life. Yes, eternal life. But there's nothing like the closeness, the presence of God in the trials of life, in the struggles of life. There's nothing like his presence. What else? You never leave you nor forsake you. How many times does he say that in the Greek? Five times. I'll never, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. It's an emphatic in the Greek. That's the security of the believer. What other promise did he give you? What, what did he give you when Jesus went to heaven? He sent somebody. He sent the Holy Spirit. Remember, what is he called? Your comforter. Remember, what is the word for comforter? Your, when I go like this, this is alongside. Para, alongside. Para. Parakalitos. He dwells alongside. He's our comforter. Remember, he lives in you, can come upon you, and he's your comforter beside you. When you're in a corner sucking your thumb sometime, when you can't take another step, you rely on the Holy Spirit. They give you a little bump. And sometimes it just takes a little bump. Because life can drag you down. Things can get hard. 
And we need God at those times. Not turn on God, turn to God in those times. Uh, 16 through 23, Jeremiah's prayer. Now, when I had delivered the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Stop right there. Now, you have made the heavens by your outstretched power. What did we see last week? We saw the universe. We saw the galaxy. And the emphasis was on each one of those little dots that were out there were galaxies with billions of light years between these things. That's the vastness of God that we're dealing with. That's the God that when people shake their fist at God and say, God, if you're going to, if you do this, then I'll believe you. It is the germ. It is the virus saying to the, to the mountain to do something. When the virus is nothing, it, it, the smallest thing you can think of. God, higher than the heavens. You, you know, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways. Your ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I tried to give an illustration in one of the teachings that I did about the difference between the, us and the expanse of the universe. And I gave so many light years and how fast light travels. And this massive expanse. That's the God that we're praying to. That's the God that we put our trust in. The God that can do everything. That's what he's saying here. And then he says these words. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. Okay, now that's important to know. When you're down the home stretch of your life, wondering why it's going this way. The home stretch. There's nothing too hard for you, God. Maybe I won't be healed from this, but I know that I know that I know that he will take me home. I know that I know that I know that he'll be with me in that process. I know that I know that I know that he will be the one that puts me to sleep. He puts his people to sleep. For if we believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Yes, we do believe that. Even rose again, even so God will bring with them those who sleep in Jesus. Or, as it is written in the original, who through Jesus sleep. You probably have a little note there in, your, in, your, in the middle column. Or through Jesus are put to sleep. This is an Arnold Fruchtenbaumism. That, that turned me on to this. So it, it's so personal to him. Remember, precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of one of his saints. Precious. And what do we see in Peter? That we're looking forward to an abundant welcoming into heaven. He'll, he'll, this abundant welcoming. Oh, man. It's, it's, it's great. Where am I at here? 17? Okay, we've got to go through 23. And you show loving kindness, kessed, to thousands and repay iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel, mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Isn't it? Cause you pause there a little bit. It gives you everything according to how, what you have done. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. What were they? Plagues. How many? Ten plagues. What were they against? The gods of Egypt. What was he demonstrating? Our God is greater. Our God is supreme. You have set the signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. To this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and you have made yourself a name as it is this day. God was name was famous in Egypt after those plagues, and everybody knew about the God of Israel is coming into the wilderness. They feared that God. They feared that God. 
You have set signs and wonders in Egypt. You have made yourself a name as it is to this day. You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, with great terror. Who was terrified in Egypt? The Egyptians, the Pharaoh was. I mean, yeah, I mean, the people experiencing blood, frogs, lice, five, flies, locusts, livestock, hail, boils, darkness, death. That was, that was it. That was 10. Yeah, that was, <laughs> I was trying to get 10. Yes. Yeah. Those are all against those gods. That was terrifying. You know what was really terrifying? Darkness before the death. It was a darkness that could be felt. There was no light at all in Egypt. No one could see uh, an inch in front of them. They were all essentially blind. But there was light in Goshen. Where God's people were. No, that was terror. You have given them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, which they didn't want to take. And they came in and took possession of it eventually. But they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. God has done this. Now, Jeremiah is comforting himself with this prayer. Okay, this stuff is happening to him. He's comforting himself. That's what we do. We go to prayer. We comfort ourselves with prayer. Ah, Lord God. It's an expression of sigh. It's like, oh, God. Oh, God. It's emotion there. By your great power, God all-powerful. Folks, we, again, we need to know this in our time of trial. God all-powerful. You have made the heavens and the earth. By your great outstretched arm, there's nothing too hard for you. Now, when you look at God, we have three, three attributes that are omni. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent. Okay. It's all powerful. He's all over, all knowing God. Omni means all. All these things. That is our God. What is Jeremiah doing for? He's comforting himself. God can do anything, including the return to Babylon, which seems impossible. Seems impossible. You are omnipotent God, all-powerful. In verse 18, we see God's loving kindness, his kesed, love or mercy shown to someone. What does God's kesed, or hesed, depends on how you want to say it, what does it mean to you? His loving kindness, what does it mean to you in your life? Grace, okay. Comfort, oh, yeah. His loving kindness. Even when I don't deserve his loving kindness, he gives us his loving kindness. He mercies us. He graces us. Remember like in John, it says like the waters flowing on Lake Michigan or the ocean, lapping over and over. We experience the grace of God. God's loving kindness, mercy. You know, real mercy is in short supply. Real mercy is in short supply. Paybacks predominate today. We have received much mercy. God is just and righteous. God will repay iniquity, perverseness, sin, guilt, and crime. But God is gracious, merciful, and righteous to his people. If a person will not respond to God's grace and mercy, what can they expect? Separation or his wrath. His wrath, his wrath will come. Remember this, God is great and mighty. He sees everything. Is that a comfort or is that scary? It is, isn't it? Because God sees me when I'm acting bad. And he sees me when I'm acting righteously. But most of the time, there's a certain amount of discomfort because we're depraved and, and we do a lot of depraved stuff. We act out of character often. And God sees these things. I feel uncomfortable. But I also feel safe and secure because he sees me. He knows me. What does it say in Psalm 130, 30, 30 something? He knows that we are just flesh. He knows we are but flesh. 
what he means to you, what he means to us. God is great and mighty. He sees all things. God sees every, everything, meaning he's omnipresent. There is no place that God is not. Listen to Psalm 139, 6 and 7. It's one of my favorites. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Where can I go that you are not God? Remember that universe? Those galaxies? Those billions and trillions of light years? Remember, God is every bit as present there as he is here. There's no distance with him. That is God. That is the God that we serve. It's astounding. When you think about comfort, his eyes are on you. Listen to these three verses. Psalm 33, 18. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. For those who hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. Our hearts shall rejoice at him because we have trusted in his holy name. Blessed are you, O God. Blessed are you, O God. Blessed are you, O God. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. His eyes are on those who fear him on those who are righteous. And the third one, the eyes of the Lord range about the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The eyes of the Lord are on his people. He sees everything. He knows every motive. He knows every thought. You cannot hide from God. He knows everything. Scary. What this means to me is I have to be real with God. I have to be honest with God. I cannot flim-flam God. I cannot sneak around and think I'm going to get away with something, although oftentimes we do. It's dark. They can't see me. It's hidden. No, it's not. God sees a big spotlight. (laughs) He's intimately aware of everything we do, every motive, everything I say and do. God will repay good, and God will repay persistent, unrepentant evil. You choose. You can live in God's grace and mercy, or you can live in his judgment and wrath. You choose. Seems to me it's an easy choice. God delivered his people from the Egyptian world. God delivered, not Moses. The God of this world vies for the attention and affection of its people. The gods. The true God will accept no competitors. You shall have no other gods before me. You will, he will cause you to choose. God will cause you to choose him. You cannot choose God and your idol. He will cause you to choose one or the other. Moment by moment, we must choose whom we shall serve. May we opt to choose the true God, or opt for the true God, moment by moment, declare our loyalty to him. When we act, con- think about this. I don't know if, this is in, if I put this in here or not. But when we act contrary to God, we are being disloyal to him. I am not representing him as he is. Every time we resist temptation, listen to this one, and obey God rather than our flesh, we are declaring loyalty to Yahweh, loyalty to God. Every time I resist temptation, every time I go against my flesh, every time I go against that thing that wants my own way, and I I say, no, I'm not going down that road, I am declaring loyalty to God. Practice the presence of God and declare your loyalty to him. I'm talking about being obedient to him in crunch time. When everything in your being wants to do something contrary to what he says to do, we are either going to be loyal to him and say, no, I'm not going to act in my flesh. I'm not going to act in my old nature. I'm going to do what's right in his eyes. Then we're declaring loyalty to him. Well, we have just a short time here. So 24 and 25, Jeremiah gets to the point of his prayer. Look, the siege mounds. I mean, there's a reality in life, isn't there? The siege mounds, they're here. They have come to the city to take it. The city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword, famine, and pestilence. What you have spoken has happened. There you see it. And you have said to me, O Lord God, you have said to me, O Lord God, Buy the field for money and take witnesses. 
Yet the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. What is he saying here? You've wasted, how can this be? This is what is happening here. Although he's told them over and over this is going to happen. But you have, he's a human. He's living through this. We're humans living through this stuff. We can lapse and we have to stay there as short a time as we can possibly do it. And then get back to reality. God, you know, I don't. I don't understand this. It's terrible. It's ugly. It's awful. But I trust you. Jeremiah is like us. and wonders what God is doing. By the land, the siege mounds are here. Captivity is certain. Sword, famine, and pestilence is here. Think about the first four sealed judgments in Revelation. That's what you see here. Sword, famine, pestilence. You have the rider on the white horse who brings the false peace. The rider on the red horse brings the, the sword, war. The rider on the white horse brings famine. Food, no food, starvation. The pale horse is death. Death. Beast, from beast of the earth. It could be wild beast or the word therion can mean small viral type beast. Like we see today. Bringing death and destruction. Look, it looks impossible. The city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Panic is setting into Jeremiah. Panic. Now next time, God is going to answer and God is going to calm Jeremiah down. See, when you go to God in your panic prayer, just stay there long enough, long enough for God to speak to you, you know, healing and calming words. Go into your, your repertoire of, of, of scriptures. You know, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I trust you, Lord. You are my God. You are my King. You are my Savior. Trust him. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can place our trust and our hope in you. Thank you that there is nothing we go through or any place we go to that you are not there. Thank you that you are with us in the fire. You are with us in the floods. You are with us in the good times and you're with us in the bad times. Thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you've promised to get us home safely and that we will have an abundant entrance into your kingdom one day. Thank you, God, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.